Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only place where you come to learn how to take apartment buildings and yes, turn them into amazing communities. I have another great guest and his name is Chris Noggle. So I'm really excited today. Chris is someone who talks about money a lot, known in the industry as the nation's number one money mentor. So because of that, this is going to be a great conversation about money. And I think oftentimes, especially in this business, you know, we can get into a lot of conversations about investing, but those investment strategies don't necessarily reflect how to build wealth, right? So this is a conversation that I'm very passionate about because I've seen this play out many times, especially in the world of real estate. But today we're going to speak with someone who has made a living essentially studying patterns of the wealthy to figure out what they have done uh, that has helped them produce wealth. And now we get to get into a conversation with Chris. So I am your host, John Brackett. Welcome to the show, Chris. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks, John. I appreciate you having me on. Anytime, buddy. All right. So let's get into this, right? Because I'm, I'm really excited and, and passionate about this conversation because I think uh, it's a great way to be able to help people move into a different stage in their life, right? Helping people, teaching them how to build wealth. One of the things I love about real estate, it's a constantly evolving business. You can never learn enough, right? Because the economy is constantly shifting. Talk to us a little bit about you know, how you got on to this conversation or this topic around money, because money can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Yeah, it does. And, you know, I grew up with no money. So that's like my story didn't start with money. It, it actually started with no money. And I grew up always, you know, being taught, don't talk about money. And then I, I went on to be a pro snowboarder, run snowboard shops. And then I landed in all places as a punk snowboard kid in Wall Street. So that's where I really started my journey of learning about money the traditional way, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. So I became a stockbroker, high-level advisor. I did that for 16 years of my life. And during that journey, what I realized is my high net worth clients that I was working with, they were never super interested in the things that I wanted to talk about. They were always looking at real estate. And I said, you know, there's got to be something to this. And then I all of a sudden entered the real estate world, probably at the wrong time, late, uh, well, mid 2000s, 2006, my first flip. And I did my first development project in 2008. And we all know that was the great recession and it, boy, oh boy, hit me like a Mack truck. So when that hit me, it brought me from making a ton of money all the way back down to basically being a month from bankruptcy. And if it wasn't for my girlfriend helping me pay the mortgage, the utilities and two people moving into my house, I probably would have. And then right after that, what happened is I dove deep into real estate because obviously Warren Buffett says, buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. So I started buying real estate in 2009, but I didn't have all the knowledge. I didn't go out and get mentors. I, I read a couple of books and I started just blindly going at it. And I got, for, for somebody with no knowledge, no history or background, I got up to 36 units by 14. And then all of a sudden I took my 37th unit to the bank and I said, you know, hey, I got one more. And they said, you don't fit in the little square box. And you come from this background. So you kind of know a thing or two about the debt to you know, credit limits and all that stuff. And that's what I hit. I hit the financial wall. They froze my line of credits. They, they took and called one of my mortgages. And the bank was actually being bought by a large uh, commercial. That's why this all happened. And I didn't know that. But I had thought I had my way. And now all of a sudden, I had to sell every one of those properties. And I was right back at the bottom again. Now, being a, a high-level advisor, you know, I knew all those regular things, but those regular things kept me on the financial hamster wheel. So right after that second part where I lost it all, I met two people. They were high net worth guys, both in real estate. One was the bank. One was the A&E TV show star. And what they were doing with money, and this is in 14, was the complete opposite of every single thing I'd ever learned as a financial advisor. And when I heard this, I said, there's something to this. So I started going to masterminds with them. I paid for some courses and I got surrounding myself. You know, they always say, get around the campfire. I got around their campfire instead of my campfire. And their campfire was filled with multimillionaires, some billionaires. And I started being a financial guy. I was never not talking about money. And I started asking them simple questions. 
Where does your money go first? What do you do with money? Are you investing in this? How are you doing that? Where's your money coming from for real estate? And I just started seeing some very unique patterns about what they were all doing. And what they were all doing is, is quite simply moving their money. They all understood that money sitting somewhere was exactly how they would not become wealthy, how they would not stay wealthy. They were all very good at performing the same acts that a bank does and moving money. They were essentially becoming their own banks. So I started doing that and I said, okay, well, how do you do that? Just put money in a bank and just shuffle it around. And I learned that they didn't even keep their money in banks. Very, very little money was kept in traditional banks because they always said, that's the stagnant pond. They don't pay me any interest. So my money isn't working while it's sitting there. And I said, yeah, you're right. It isn't. And you know, I said, it must be in stocks. And they said, no, that's too risky. Real estate guys are conservative. We don't like stock market risk. We'll take a, a gamble here and there, but we don't like that. We got steady, eddy, tangible assets. So I said, okay, so what are you using? And they started talking about privatized banking, what the wealthy have been doing for hundreds of years. And then they linked it back. And this was Greg. And he started talking about the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and all these wealthy, wealthy families on how they created banking systems using insurance companies. And I'm like, wait, no, what do you mean insurance companies? And they said, yeah, giant mutually owned insurance companies. We set up, we deposit money in them. I said, you can't, I was an advisor. I'm like, you can't just walk in to these big insurance companies and just say, hey, take my money. They laugh at you. And he said, yeah, of course we don't do that. We set up our banking systems by using whole life insurance. And I said, listen, man, whole life insurance is a terrible place to put your money. They said, yeah, yeah, but you're thinking of regular whole life. They're like, these are very specially designed policies that are built for banking and for, it's, it, they said, just look it up, look up Bully. And I said, Bully, I said, bank owned life insurance? They said, yeah, the banks do this. Just look up what they do. You know, everybody that I talked to on that side, these, these very wealthy families and these family offices, they were always telling me, they always talk to me like I should know this. You know, and I'm like, you're right, I should know this. I'm like, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't know this, so tell me more. But it was always like, yeah, just, just look this up. Just look that up. It was never like, you know, take my hand and walk me through because they all learned it from somebody else and they weren't teaching it. They were simply using it. And I learned this and I started learning the power of uninterrupted compound interest and how these people were using this vehicle but they weren't taking money like I thought and just putting it in these policies and just saying, all right, I'm done. That would be great, but they'd only be making 4% guaranteed. They were putting it in, taking it out, putting it into real estate, doing private lending. Like the big thing Greg did was private lending. He, he lent me money at 15%. He lent his money out all over the place. And that, so again, he was just doing what the bank did. And as soon as I realized this, I said, okay, wait a second. So if this works using this privatized bank, what else does it work for? And he said everything, like, think about it. It's just using banking techniques and just moving money and all the same things that you use for a bank, like cars and paying off credit cards and doing all this stuff. Just be the bank. Just treat your money the same as you would treat the bank's money. It sounds so profound. And it was even more profound to me because I came from that world. And that world never once taught me that because it wasn't conducive as an advisor or for the brokerages. They couldn't make any money because what I learned is the way that they did this with these specially designed and engineered whole life policies is the people that were setting these plans up were not normal insurance agents. They weren't financial advisors. They were these guys that were willing to take a 60 to 90% cut in their commission so that the other people had access to 60 to 90%. And I'm like, oh, remember earlier we were talking about charities, right? And people have to give more. Someone has to give for someone else to get. But I mean, I could go on all day with this, but I mean, that banking technique that I learned back in 2014 and 15 can be applied to self-directed IRAs, to 401ks, to almost any account you want. But the most efficient one that there is on earth is these specially designed whole life policies that are done with mutually owned insurance companies that pay dividends. And, and that's what I learned. It sounds so boring and it is, but that's okay. what the wealthy so do. You, okay. So let me ask you a couple of questions, right? Please. Let's unpack this a little bit for our audience because for most people, when they hear a whole life policy, or that could mean something very, very different, right? You're talking now about, about life insurance, okay? It's a life insurance policy. And of course, that's not my area of expertise, but it's something that I've looked into. I don't have, you know, a permanent policy for a couple of different reasons, but, you know, the argument really is always whole life versus, you know, permanent life insurance versus term versus, okay, investing the balance, right? 
those are kind of the scenarios that people look at. So inside of that, though, you added the word private banking to that. And that means it's, that's going to mean something different for a lot of different people. Okay. But in this context, really what you're talking about is learning how to deploy capital, whether your own or other people's, like how high net worth people do, correct? Precisely. Okay, perfect. And so, okay, beautiful, man. So let's talk a little bit about insurance, okay? So you said a couple things there, you know, whole life and then your, you know, guaranteed rate. So why life insurance as a vehicle through which you see other wealthy investors shifting money into to then use for other opportunities. You know, what's the explanation there? And I want to be clear, like, you know, a lot of people, when I say whole life, their mind immediately goes to what they've learned about whole life. But when you, and I don't have time to fully unpack how it's designed and everything, but this isn't anything like a regular whole life. It doesn't perform the same, look the same. It's totally different in the way that it's designed. I still own a ton of term insurance because term is what I use to protect all the mortgages I have on all my rental portfolio. So I still use term, but I use these plans for banking. So here's the gist of it. And I can make it very simple. We all deposit our money. We, we go out, we work hard, we make money, we sell real estate, we do whatever, and we make money, right? That money comes in and where does it go? It goes into a traditional bank. And when it goes into that traditional bank, how much does the bank pay you? Next to nothing. But why do we do that? Because we know if we want that money, we can go back and take it and redeploy it somewhere else. That's why we use banks. It's the liquidity plus there's a guarantee, the FDIC guarantee, but we don't make hardly anything on those bank accounts. The only one making money are the banks, which they make 400 to 1300% more than we do. And that's on bauerfinancial.com if anyone wants to look that up. So here's the, the reason why I and these other wealthy individuals use this specially designed and engineered whole life. Change one thing in what you do every day. Change where your money goes first. So first you were putting it into a bank, their savings. Now change where your savings goes and put it into this specially designed and engineered whole life plan. Okay. And also the whole life is the privatized banking plan. That's what privatized banking is. Look it up. We put it into this privatized bank. Now immediately when we put our money there, we can take our money out. Well, that sounds a lot like a bank, right? I put my money in the bank. I can immediately take it out. I put my money in this banking, this privatized banking plan. I can immediately take the money out. So now we got similarities except for the insurance companies, because their long-term investment strategy can pay you a guaranteed return in interest of 4%. Now, that's about four times more than some banks, at least three times more than most banks will pay you. Plus, every year they give you a dividend. So the wealthy understand that if I'm going to put my money somewhere, I need it to at least pace inflation. So if inflation's 3.2, we need to beat that. 4% indeed does. But now, Forget about just putting it there because nobody would do it for 4%. Me, you, and everybody else listening to this, you know how to make way more than 4%. Great. But you know how to make more than 4% plus still make the 4% on the money. This is where the magic comes in. You put your money in this privatized bank. We then take it out. In the first year, in all transparency, you can't take all of it. How much? 60 to 90% depending on design. So let's say I put 100 grand in my privatized bank. I then immediately in the first 30 days or less, when my check clears, take out $90,000. Now I'm holding 90 grand and I started with 100 in this account, right? How much of my money am I getting interest on by the simple math? If I put 100 in and I took 90 out, what would you say? Uh, well, you would say 10, but you're probably getting it paid on the full 100,000. The full 100,000. Yeah. You're making interest and dividends on the full 100, but now you have 90 grand in your hand. How can that be? Well, it's simple. That privatized bank, Okay, the insurance company actually just gave you money from their general account. You didn't ever take your hundred grand out. It's still sitting in there making interest, earning uninterrupted compound interest. But you took the 90 grand because the insurance company loaned it to you. Now that's a swear word. Loan, right? Loan. We always think loans are bads, but there's good and bad debt. The loan that they gave you was nothing more than an advance against your death benefit. So if you that hundred thousand I put in got me a million dollar death benefit, which I didn't do it for the death benefit, I just took that million dollars down by 90,000. The insurance company just advanced me part of the death benefit that they have to pay out someday when I graduate. Now, I'm earning that 4% plus dividend, which let's just call it 6% because that's what it is in 2021. I got 6% getting paid to me. Now I got 90 grand. Now let's just say, I, John, let's say you came to me and you got a project and you needed 90 grand. 
I loan that 90 grand to you at 10%. So now you're paying me interest of 10% on that $90,000, but I'm still making the 4% plus dividend, which is 6%. And the only thing I lost in the middle is that loan the insurance company gave me against my death benefit, they charged me 5%. So we could do the math either way. We can take the six the insurance company's paying me with dividend minus the five, which means I make 1% net there. Or I can take the 10 that you're paying me, subtract the five, and now all of a sudden now I'm making five. It doesn't matter how you do the math. You are earning uninterrupted compound interest. Now, some people would say, yeah, 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 Chris, but what about that loan? What The loan the insurance company gave me against my death benefit? Great. I have the option and the control of not paying that back if I don't want. You could give me that, that 90 grand and when you pay it back, sure, I can put it back in my policy and repay that $90,000 loan, which I would because now I'm not giving the insurance company 5% okay, or I could so, take the 90, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. I get the math. I totally get the math, right? So of the $100,000 that you're actually you know, using to purchase this policy with, how much of that gets actually goes into the policy, right? Is it, because it's not 100%, is it 100,000 is earning interest and dividends. So we take $100,000, right? We use it to purchase this policy. Okay, how much of that 100 is remaining after fees, expenses, et cetera? So the first year would be about $90,000. That's why I use that example. It's actually probably a little bit more, but I just rounded down. Sure. And so, listen, I want to be clear. There's different ways you can do it. Remember I said 60 to 90. I'm using a specially designed one that's best for short-term use, which would give you 90 to 93% immediately. Okay, great. So the, the summary that I, what I heard you say is, John, this is an option, right? Through which, you know, you can have money earning interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also have life insurance, right? And then be able to withdraw that money, as you put it, okay, to use for other purposes. I'm not an expert in that, nor am I mm -hmm. licensed to be able to, to discuss that at the level that you are. But the point there being is what I'm trying to do is understand the mechanics, right? So that our audience has a better idea of what that mm -hmm. looks like, what it sounds like, and then ultimately what some of the uses are, right? Okay, Absolutely. awesome. So Chris, now we have this concept, right? We have this concept and you know, you've been able to articulate that, hey, look, this is a tool that I have seen over the years that other investors have used, right? Other wealthy individuals. Now, with that being said, what are some of the other non-traditional investments outside of that one sure. that you see people have a great deal of success with as a vehicle to building wealth? Well, outside of real estate, because obviously that's, that's the foundation. I mean, every wealthy person I've ever met has their hands in real estate in one form or the other, whether it's passively or actively. So okay. let's talk about other places because we need money to buy real estate. So what other vehicles can you use? The wealthy I've seen use self-directed IRAs or what they would call solo Ks and different forms of these self-directed retirement accounts to do this. And you know, it's no different. Nothing's different about a regular traditional IRA and a self-directed traditional IRA outside of the custodian, except for the self-directed IRA gives you the ultimate use and control of what you want to do with that money. So what Greg had taught me, and Greg basically is big in the self-directed space, he had taught me that you put your money in this self-directed IRA, which, you know, a lot of, if you look at where the wealth is, there's 40 plus trillion dollars sitting in employer-sponsored retirement plans. With COVID, a lot of people just lost their jobs, transferred, pivoted. So that money's still sitting in those old 401k plans with those small basket of mutual funds. So what a lot of people should do is take the money from there, move it into a self-directed. Now, this is if they know how to move it. And then remember, I was talking with the privatized bank about moving the money. You just right. got to move the money. So what could you do? Well, again, remember that 90000 I loaned to you from the privatized bank? Well, let's say that 90000 came from my self-directed IRA. I give you 90 grand. You make payments back to me of 10%. And then when you close on your deal, you basically pay me the 90 back. I just made 10% on my $90,000 that I loaned you. Self-directed IRAs are a big thing. Not only self-directed IRAs, but a lot of times people will basically leverage access to the hidden equity in their homes. So there's two ways to do this. We all know about hidden equity, the equity that sits in your house, lazy. And the mental picture I tell people is I say, I want you to imagine if you've got equity in your house, here's what it looks like. You come home after a hard day at work. You open your door, you're exhausted, and you look into your living room, and right there on your couch is your money, drinking your soda, eating your potato chips, and watching your TV. And your money looks back at you and says, what, did you have a hard day? Your money is allowed to just sit on your couch lazy, but you got to change that. You should march over to your money, 
grab the potato chips, knock the pop on the ground and say, you're going to work. You're never coming home. And I don't care what you have to say. And you know what your money would say? Thank God, John, I've been waiting for this moment. I'm so sick of watching these reruns. I was just waiting for you to tell me what to do. because I just don't know what to do. And you say, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go to work and you're never going to come home. And I want you to start here. And I'm not, I'm, every time you run out of things to do, I'm going to send you back out. Your money smiles and laughs and is joyful and never asks for a break. Or You see, equity in your house, if it's sitting there, is that lazy money. So what, what else do the wealthy do? Well, the wealthy leverage equity in their properties. You do the same thing I'm sure we all do. You take that equity out, you redeploy it into additional deals, additional investments. You lend it out and become the bank. Just like my hat says, BYOB, become your own bank. You could use equity. But what about somebody that doesn't qualify for a home equity line of credit for one way or the other? Well, then comes the private world. There's private investors all over the place. And there's organizations that do this that will give you an advance of your equity. Okay. And they will participate then. There's no debt, no monthly payments. They don't want a penny from you. Okay. What they want is they want the future appreciation of your house. So they'll give you all the equity in your house. You don't ever have to pay them a monthly payment and they create no debt but they become a lien on your house and they can be in a second position. And then someday, 10, 30 years down the line, when you sell your house, they're going to basically get roughly, and it's different for each one. I don't do this, but I know about this, 30 to maybe 35% of your future appreciation. If your house goes down in value, they share in your loss. Okay. You see, it's private equity. So it's an, they're making an investment into you and your house and you get access to your money. There is nothing more powerful, John, than being in control of your money. And I'm just reaching in my pocket and I'll pull out money. This $100 bill that I'm holding in my hand, this is worth the most it will ever be worth today. It's not going to be worth more in five years, 10 years. So why do we give up control of this $100 and put it in all these various places just to leave it sit there? We need to move that money. I'm just showing you different ways to move money through different vehicles. That's okay. All. all right. So let me explain this, I think, in a way that our audience will understand, right? So you're talking about different vehicles that people can use to, to house money into, right? Move their money really would be the better word. We want to move our money. We don't want to leave our money sitting any place. We want to move it and constantly keep it in motion. Okay. So the word that I use for that, man, is currency, right? Equity is currency. I'll tell you a really short story, and I never forgot this. So many years ago, when I was still in banking, I, I had a job interview. It was a local bank, and now they're a pretty big bank. They started off small, and they started building this expertise in, in real estate, right? So I met with the president, had this interview, and you know, I, I never forgot. He said, you know, I, one of my questions was, hey, how do you folks compete? What makes you different? How are you able to compete and maintain some of the growth objectives that you have. And his comment was, John, he said, now we have currency, right? And I never forgot that. And I had him clarify, well, what do you mean? But the point there being is very similar concept, right? You can shift and move equity. Now they have, they have equity. They have cash and currency that they can play with, right? Not cash in the, in the traditional sense, currency in the sense that they have equity. The bank has equity that they could deploy in a couple of different, different ways, right? Now their, their brand is, is growing. People know who they are. They also have earnings that they can redeploy into other investment opportunities. Deposits are growing, right? Which they can redeploy as well. The point there being is currency. So the comment was the way that I've been able to relate that to the things that I do, my career, and the other people that I work with is what equity do you have Okay, that you can start thinking about finding ways to re redeploy that or shift that is the term that you use into other investment opportunities that are going to produce a greater return than what that currency is doing today, right? And that currency could be, to your point, equity in a home. It could be also knowledge that you have, right? Or a specific trade that you can barter. I've done that before, right? I've, I've, help people. I provided, you know, financial advice, right? We've traded things, my time to help do that for other services. And I have done that in investments as well, especially electrician, the electrical plumbing, those are really common, right? We've done in-kind work. We've traded work before, but the point there being is currency. What currency could, do you have today that you could leverage to shift into an investment 
that's going to produce a higher return than what it's currently doing today. With that being said, Chris, let's talk about real estate for a minute, right? Sure. So now we've educated our audience that currency can take on different forms. But the point there being is it's something that's marketable that you can move, whether it be the knowledge that you have, right? What I call specific information, or it could be equity that you have in your home, equity that you have in real estate, or it could be cash that's sitting idle in an IRA for that matter, in the bank. The point there being is now you have currency, right? And now, so let's talk about, let's give our audience some ideas on how you can deploy that into real estate, right? So you working with high net worth individuals over the last couple of years, how that money is being deployed or that currency rather is being deployed into the real estate markets today. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's a big, you know, a lot has just happened in the past year and, you know, there's a lot more coming in the future, good, bad, or indifferent. So I'm seeing a lot of wealthy people looking for opportunities and where are they going to put their money? And a lot of them are really looking at affordable housing because there's a lot of loft apartments. I mean, you're in San Diego, I'm in Buffalo, but there's very expensive loft apartments being built all over, but there's a lack of affordable housing. So I'm seeing a lot of money going to more price conscious apartment complexes, whether they're being built ground up or they're buying C's and turning them into B's or maybe uh, mobile home parks. I'm seeing a big push in mobile home parks. Was not my flavor, but I'm seeing that. I'm also seeing a large push into, and this is going to sound really weird, but land flipping. A lot of them are really starting to buy raw land and they're buying it pennies, pennies on the dollar. And they're basically just selling it to neighbors. They're repositioning it, redoing it. I'm seeing that a lot. You know what I'm not seeing, which is kind of where I carve my niche is flipping. A lot of people are flipping right now, but it's very difficult in this environment, I think to make a ton of money sustainably in flipping. I think people that are getting into flipping are going to just, I hate to say this, but I think they're going to get caught with their pants down, just like a lot of them did in 2006, seven, when the eight hit. I'm not seeing a lot of that, but sustainable, affordable housing is big. And I think this is what you were asking. And also repurposing of a lot of the retail space, strip malls. I drive around here and I, I know Wall Street's, you know, all time highs, but Main Street isn't looking so good, folks. Like my main street's not looking good. These strip malls have vacancy after vacancy after vacancy. What's going to happen when they hit their critical mass and they can't make their payments or their tenants can't pay their rent? Somebody's going to have to repurpose that or there's going to be a lot of opportunity in that space. And medical is huge right now. So I think a lot of repurposing to multi-use, to medical buildings. I mean, I don't know if you're seeing any of this in San Diego. I know this is a big thing we're seeing here in the Buffalo market. And I'm talking to investors all over in real estate. And this is it. And I've also seen a lot more transition to being the bank and lending. There's a ton of people lending money out on these real estate deals. And I, that's what I do. I mean, I've came from flipping lots and lots of houses with the show on TV to now, I don't want to flip any houses. What I want to do is lend money to people that want to put the energy in because I found that the less work I have to do, the less gray hair I have. So lending it, being the bank, has just been a much easier push. And as long as you understand how to protect yourself with the, the assets and the security, then you're going to be fine. And it all comes down to understand the, the valuations and the, maybe the future valuations of the property you lend on. So let me share something, man, because I think you hit on some things that, that actually are kind of important concepts for folks to understand, right? Especially as it relates to wealth either building wealth or having your wealth impacted for that matter, right? But in the US, we, we live in a very predictable market to some degree, right? Meaning a lot of the production that we have in this country is being driven by leverage, by debt, okay? We are a debt hungry country. We love debt, okay? It's part of how we, our monetary policy, right? For that matter, right? Is, is a leverage on debt. We either throw more money into the marketplace by buying bonds, or we slow that down with interest rates, right? Or vice versa. But one of the, the very interesting things to me is when you look at what's going on right now, okay, there's this feeling of wealthiness that's happening. If you really look at it, it's not because we're producing more. It's simply because assets are being inflated, right? Bingo. So stock market, right? You know, the portfolio that was once a 401k plan that was once, you know, $200,000 is now $400,000, right? 
So the natural tendency is, hey, I feel wealthier. I'm going to go out and buy some stuff. I'm going to spend more money. I'm going to invest more. Same thing with real estate. Prices now are being driven up and the natural tendency is, hey, I feel wealthier. So I share that because I think it's really important for all of us to understand that there's a really big difference when you're producing more and actually earning a higher level of income. And that is being translated into your bank accounts versus you have assets that are being inflated and sure on your balance sheet, your wealth has grown, right? Because your asset levels are going up, but that doesn't translate into income unless you liquidate those assets. But the natural tendency is that we spend more money or we deploy more capital based on this perception, right? That, hey, this is going to be there in the future. So I think what you were kind of alluding to earlier was you're going to have a lot of folks that deploy money based on that notion, right? Hey, I'm borrowing money. I'm deploying more capital because I can see that my assets have gone up in value, but that is on paper primarily. And so when the stock market takes a turn, right? And things go down again, okay? That's when things are gonna start shifting. And it's, it's this compound effect that happens, right? It's this compound effect, except it goes in, in the opposite direction. It starts going backwards. Yes, you hit on so many important things. See, when your 401k balance is high and all these things look high on paper, those are the telltale signs of the past of the people when they look at that, that artificial inflation, it does, it makes you feel wealthy, you spend more, you're seeing it happen everywhere. But the thing you're missing, and I didn't get into this because I don't want to get into this conversation, but your money is getting weaker every single day, which is why things are getting more expensive. It's called inflation. And inflation doesn't mean goods and services go up in price. It means that when they print $4 trillion, $5 trillion, $6 trillion, your dollar becomes worth less. So it takes more of them to buy goods and services. When they print this much money, your dollar is being completely destroyed. I don't know what the impact is. That right there is unprecedented. The government running at 120% of GDP, or maybe it's 130 now, is unsustainable. But we're in a modern monetary theory, economic like thought, and it's not sustainable. It won't be. But that artificial feeling people feel is exactly why someone like myself and a lot of the people I surround ourselves with, we're investing less. I know that doesn't make any sense. We're right now, we're making great money and we're holding it, but I'm not sitting on money. You see, the best way to get out of all of these problems goes back to initially what I said. Money in motion will weather any storm. If your money's constantly moving and nimble and able to be pivoted, your money will never take, you might get hit a little in a downturn in the stock market because you might have, you know, get caught with your pants down with something. But if it's moving and it's not sitting somewhere on a balance sheet or in a 401k, if it's constantly out there in different things, you will always be in control and you'll always make money because then when things go down, things get real exciting because now you just move your money into lower priced assets that pay you even more. This is what the wealthy do, folks. And I love that you framed that up because that's exactly, I hate to say I'm a capitalist. Okay. So when I look at what's going on right here, I know what's coming. And I know when that comes in order for me to make millions and millions more, I have to unfortunately wait for it because one person makes when one person loses. When one person's selling, one person's buying. The person that's buying is the person that was nimble, had control of their money, and was, was ready to deploy it at the right time. Too many people are deploying all their, like they're taking everything. I'm all in, right? It's like the casino table. I'm all in. Not me. <laughs> I'm the guy sitting behind the watching all table. these hey, man, people. So I got to share something with you, okay? Please, please. So my wife and I, were in, we went to Tahoe. This was many years ago. And uh, it was for New Year's Eve, okay? And so this is going to be a great example to, uh, to what you just said earlier, right? I'm all in. So we're at this table. We get in, you know, we walk in. We're hanging out for a while. We're at this table, a craps table. And man, you had, this thing was just packed. You probably had 20, 30 people standing around because whoever was rolling the dice was really, really hot, right? Just incredible. Probably about 15 minutes into this run, everybody going off. You had this guy walk in and this was right after a roll. He wedged his way in, took out his check, threw it in the middle of the table, 
And I know he meant to break it, right? Like, hey, I'm going to break this. I'm going to cash it so I can get some money back and then, and then play the dice. Dearly looked at him and said, are you all in? <laughs> so can you imagine the pressure there? And, you know, these guys get trained to do that, right? So can you imagine the pressure there? I mean, that was a bad move, first of all. But 30 people looking at you, waiting to see how you'd respond. And guess what his response was? I'm all in. I'm all in. <laughs> I'm all in. And on the next roll, I mean, I never felt this kind of tension in the air before, right? Everybody waiting. Everybody just, right, just on the edge, waiting to see what the outcome of that roll would be. Because this guy had a huge check on the table that, you know, I'm sure he meant to break it, but now he was fully committed to this next role, right? So man, the crowd was just waiting for this thing to happen. I mean, you can see everything in slow motion, right? Dice just being released from the guy's hand. And it was like a movie, right? Dice started twirling in slow motion. Everybody just looking at this thing. The dice hits the back wall, right? Rolls onto the table and everybody gets really quiet. <laughs> and then you just hear this loud gasp. Ah, man, the guy lost everything. In that one roll, right? That's the best analogy to what's going on right yeah. so now. So rolling the dice with all in because of pressure, because you're looking at what everyone else is doing and you feel you need to be all in. And so I agree with that, man. And I never forgot that. In fact, I talk about that every now and again to provide that as an example, because I, I just never forgot that, never forgot that. Well, hey, Chris, look, this has been a great show. I appreciate your conversation on money and just some of your learning lessons over the years. But I think just as important, sharing with us some of the things that you're seeing in this market that not only can disrupt money, but also potentially create opportunities for folks to be able to take advantage of, right? I think that's great. So with that said, you know, I want to ask you this question because I've been asking you questions now for about 40 minutes for that matter. What is the one question, Chris, that you have of me that you think can add some value to our audience? What do you think the biggest problem in America is right now? Are you referring to? You Not know, referring to anything at all. Just but me, do you think the biggest problem in America is? Okay. So let, let me qualify that a little bit, right? The reason why I was going to ask, what are you referring to specifically? Because we're on the topic of money. If this is a general question, general, sure, let, me, general, let, me answer, please. let me answer that. I think the biggest challenge, man, that we have right now is the fact that we are a country with no soul, man. We're just floating around out there. And let me qualify that even further, right? So the United States is the most amazing country in the world. Correct. Amazing country. And I am very grateful, man, for this country, especially for those that have gone before us to be able to create the liberties that we have today, right? So my whole philosophy is, hey, look, we have these liberties. We got to do something with it. Tell my kids that all the time. Do something with it. I think one of the challenges, man, that we're facing right now is we've come out of a leadership scenario where great economic policy, some great economic policies, right, from the previous administration, but very little leadership around bringing everybody together as a country, right? So the, the biggest challenge that we're facing right now is we have a lot of politicians with a lot of great ideas, but we don't have any statesmen and women anymore, it's becoming a rare breed. So when we, we're, we have this amazing amount of freedoms that we do in this country, and we need leadership out there to direct, to help move this country forward. When you don't put the interests of this country first, things just start falling or going sideways, right? And I think we've kind of seen that before, really last year for that matter. So. I think the biggest challenge that we're having right now is we absolutely are in need of leadership that will put the best interests of this country first. Yeah, and and right. so here's the thing, I, you know, most people call that statesmanship, stateswomanship, whatever, but we are running out of statesmen and women, folks that are willing to put the interest of this country before their people. own and before their lobbyists. It's just becoming a very rare breed of people, right? Very rare breed of, breed of people. And I think the consequence of that, we have now been experiencing for a couple of years now. So anyways, that's just my opinion. You're right. And the reason I ask that is I live my life 
by a simple quote from a gentleman, but we all know Will Rogers. And Will Rogers says the biggest problem in America is not what people don't know. The biggest problem in America is what people think they know that just ain't so. Everything I do is based on that. I never ever pretend that I think I know everything. I can always learn. And I think that's a big problem we have right now. People think they know. And it's just the old thing. You know, if you're making a bunch of money in the stock market, you're now an expert stock broker or stock picker. If you're making a bunch of money, you know, flipping houses, you think you're the best house flipper. But people don't know what they don't know. And they don't want to learn because they're closed off that creativity part and they've started to conform with what everybody else is doing. And that, I think, is the biggest problem we're faced with right now. Kind yeah, of. I mean, you know, what you just, I mean, you can summarize that in a couple of words, right? Independent thinkers. Yes, um, creators. And, yeah, and I agree with that, man, to some degree. And the other side of that, you know, I, I think that argument could be challenged. But Sure, I'm sure think, everything can. You know, I think the biggest challenge right now that we face as a country, okay, is making sure we have folks in office that actually put this country first. And I think that's the greatest opportunity that we have, but it's proven to be very challenging because of the influences from outside parties, right? Lobbyists, self-interest, and it's, it's just a reality of, I think, what we are dealing with and what we've dealt with in the past. So that would just be my humble opinion for that matter. No, oh, that's a good one. I think we've lost our way. And I think I hope, I'm very hopeful, I'm an optimist. I think we will find our way back. It's just a matter of when. And yeah. unfortunately, I think uh, that when could be quite some time from now. Yeah, no, I, I'm funny, man. So I'm going to just share something, right? That I'll, I'll pivot out of this. But, you know, my philosophy has always been, it's my responsibility to put myself and my family in positions where we can find ways to move forward, right? Being overly dependent on anyone for that matter is a great recipe for disaster. And so that's why my comment was about the country losing its soul is because leadership has to be willing to put this country first, right? I can do the rest. I can do that. I don't need you wor to worry about me. That's my job. <laughs> that's my job. But I do need you to worry about what's in the best interest of this country. So anyways, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Easy. Just go to chrisnoggle.com, N-A-U-G-L-E. Everything's on there and all my stuff I give away for free because I believe that if you help enough people get what they want, you get what you want. The great Zig Ziglar. Awesome, man. Hey, thank you, buddy, for being on. I want to wish you continued success, and I will talk to you soon, man. Thank you. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.